Okay, I have a unique pleasure to introduce the afternoon session on transportation sharing systems. I guess this first speaker is David Schmois, who, uh, by the way, happens to be my husband, which makes it a little more awkward. Uh, we are both at Cornell, and he has been working on all kinds of optimizations, but for the last many years have been involved in uh, the bike sharing system, which is what he is going to talk about. Great. Thanks, Eva. So indeed, I'm going to talk about uh, bike sharing systems and their operation as a case study in the kinds of real-time decision making and decision making more generally. Um, so many of you have seen a bike sharing system in action. You only need to walk out to Bancroft to, to see it firsthand. Um, but in case you haven't, here, you know, bike sharing 101. Uh, so a bike sharing system, first of all, consists of a map of stations. Uh, a, at least as the dock version in North America most prevalent. Um, a station consists of a set of docks, um, which are then filled with bikes, hopefully not completely filled with bikes. Uh, and a user uh, is allowed to pick up a bike at any station and uh, rent it to take it. Typically a subscriber has a fab like this, you stick it into the dock, it releases a bike, and then uh, uh, you can return the bike at any station in the system. Uh, so your phone app will have a display that looks something like this. Uh, this is uh, around NYU in New York City. Uh, each of those little thought bubbles corresponds to a station. Uh, the level of the dark blue in the, the bubble reflects the uh, fraction of docks at that station that are currently filled with bikes. So you can see here, um, it's, things are a little low on bikes, and uh, here we're completely out of docks. So, so there's so this two-sided problem of both needing availability for both bikes and docks at any, any given place. A uh, group at Cornell uh, has been involved in bike sharing uh, since, since the initiation of City Bike in May 2013. And I guess I, I hurried through the title slide. I should, should emphasize that, that this is really the work of two of my PhD students, um, Owen Omani, now at Uber, uh, and Daniel Freund, um, and collaborative with uh, my colleague in OR at Cornell, Shane Henderson, and many, many students that have participated in different projects along the way. Uh, so to give you a sense of just, let's focus on New York City's city bike to give you some order of magnitude. Uh, in a good mo weather month this year in 2017, there were nearly two, two million rides in New York City that were taken in part of the system. Paris, which perhaps has a notoriety for, for being the first large, very large system, uh, is, is still a bit bigger at three million rides. Uh, but uh, the trajectory is increasing. There were like 10 million rides in City Bike in, in 2015, 14 million rides uh, in 2016. I don't know the figures yet for 2017, but it's going to be close to 20 million, maybe even over 20 million, um, all totaled. Uh, currently, there are roughly 12,000 bikes in the system and more than 500 stations, and there just is continual ongoing expansion of the, of the system itself. When we got involved, we earned our street cred actually by helping them uh, route repairmen for uh, uh, battery replacement in, in their first uh, months, uh, first weeks, really days and weeks of, of crisis level. Um, but the main focus of our interaction has been what commonly goes under the name of rebalancing. And I'll talk much more about that. Uh, give you a sense of, of North American statistics. Um, this is, uh, gives you a sense of the, the, the steady rate of increase, um, not just in New York, but, but really uh, throughout. Um, I should point out that for several of these, uh, Capital Bike Share, Divi, um, and Hubway, uh, they are all under the same conglomerate uh, umbrella company, Motivate. And, and so many of the things that I, although I'm focusing on, on City Bike, uh, many of the pieces of analytical tools that we've done for New York have been exported uh, to the other systems. So I, I already mentioned the word imbalance. What do I mean by imbalance? Uh, the question is, the, the issue is that the asymmetry of, of demand, uh, of where bikes people tend to commute um, from and the intensity of, of the commute patterns means that you, some stations may be without any uh, docks free and some may be without 
um, bikes free, and that of course leads to upset customers. So the first thing I want to do is just give you a feel for the kind of data that we have as part of the system, and and uh, in some sense uh, that will then lead to how we actually make decisions. So the first thing I want to do is show you a day in the life of New York City. Uh, this is actually a bit old data by now. It's maybe June of 2016. Um, this I can tell from the pattern of stations. Each of these circles represents a station in, in New York. Um, and as you watch the, the day evolve, the radius of the city is going to be your indication of the intensity of the net flow of bikes. The color is going to indicate whether that net flow is in or out, blue being um, more, more flow in, red being more flow out. Um, uh, at the top, you're going to see you have a clock, which uh, will start at midnight, and we'll watch what happens uh, throughout the day. Okay, so get this started. Um, it's the middle of the night, but you know this is the city that never sleeps. So, so you see some percolation of, of activity of, of some, but it's really low level. Now it's starting to be dawn, and the first thing you'll see is the traffic hubs. The Port Authority and, and Penn Station wake up with people leaving it, and they're going down to the Penn Station. Now the East Village is waking up, and, uh, um, and, and now you're going traffic into uh, uh, Midtown. And, uh, and now it's the rush hour has calmed down. Things are a little bit quieter. There's maybe a little pickup around noon um, for uh, um, additional traffic. And now you're going to see the reverse, more or less, for the, rever the evening commute. You're going to see outgoing traffic from the financial district, outgoing traffic from Midtown, into the transit hubs, back into the residential neighborhood of the East Village. The evening rush hour is a bit longer than the uh, afternoon, uh, the, than the morning one. Um, lingering just a, a, a bit further, and little by little we fade back to uh, um, the uh, um, um, way we started at, at midnight. Okay, so that gives you a sense. There's 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 a oh, definite sense in which the um, rush hours are the dominant piece. It's not by any means the the, the you know it, it's not everything. Uh, there is this asymmetry of, of, of directionality uh, between the, the two rush hours. It's not perfectly symmetric, and therein lies a lot of the challenges. Uh, and uh, that we have a pretty quiet period overnight where hopefully we can take advantage of that to uh, do some planning. Now, one of the nice things about a system like this is that it sort of records its own state. Uh, so here we have a plot. Um, so this is one day in the life of a station at Atlantic and Fort Greene in Brooklyn. Uh, the y-axis is the number of bikes in that station, and the x-axis gives us the time from 6 a.m. to midnight. Uh, and, and we sort of see the fill level. And this is a very uninteresting station. You might notice that here we have an outage, um, where at that point there are, are no bikes. Um, but, but by and large, it's a pretty une uneventful day. And now, of course, you might say, well, was this typical? Um, here are actually three days in the, sa uh, in the same week. We, we see that, yeah, this one was kind of unfortunate in that we maybe started the fill uh, with too few bikes at 6 a.m. And as a result, we went out. Uh, but, but, but by and large, this isn't a big deal one way or the other. Okay, and this is a boring station. This is, at least at this point in the, in the life of the system, by now actually I think this is a significantly more active station. Uh, but put but that in contrast with the same week, um, here's a, oh actually one more thing I wanted to point out, this green line across the top uh, is the capacity of that station. This is how many docks there actually were at this are at this station. So somewhere in excess of 60. So we're in a you know, great you know, number of docks that, that just simply were never used um, and, and seem likely to never be used given the, the, the state of traffic. Um, here's actually a somewhat smaller station. It's under 40 docks um, located in the heart of Midtown. So 52nd and 5th Avenue. Um, and, and you see much more wild oscillations in, in the uh, uh, rate of, of incoming traffic. And they're not, not terribly surprising. As we saw in uh, the, 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 the day in the life, in the morning we have large incoming net flows. In the afternoon we have large outgoing net flows. 
but you might wonder, well, what's a spike like this? This is a rebalancing truck. This is a truck arriving with a, a large number of bikes, I guess about 30. So it's probably, it's a box truck. And then we see it just gets the sucked out of the system and, and uh, um, we get used up. And indeed, you see some of the effects of rebalancing um, throughout the day. Okay, so, and, and, and one other sort of from 30,000 feet perspective that while you know, the, the profiles of these days are similar. Stochasticity means at any given point in time, you know, every day is a little bit different. But, but sort of maybe not so quite. So if you look at Balaji's plots from uh, taxi traffic, uh, there, the, in, in part due to the uh, unpredictability of rebalancing, probably more than anything else, the, the signature from day to day is, ha, has a bit more variability in it. Yeah, these are also in the tens of bikes. Yes. The yeah. Thousands. Yes. In my settled that level. There are ways in which you don't really know everything about the system. Uh, if you look at this plot, um, that, and you look at what's happening up here, uh, you can see that something isn't quite right. Uh, you have this this sort of random walk of getting to some level and then losing a bike and getting to some level losing a bike, and you never hit the capacity. Uh, you have a broken dock. Yeah. Uh, so, 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 you know, inferring what's what's going on, you know, takes a little bit of reading between the lines. Yes. This does not yet take into account uh, customer disappoint disappointments. No, this is this is just raw data. So, so, so we we have really, and 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 I'll talk about this momentarily. We know about the transactions that occurred. We don't know about the transactions that didn't occur because there wasn't supply. And and uh, and this is the effect that we you know really want to do something to figure out to um, make sure that, that we have an appreciation for for what the data is telling us. Yeah. So you mentioned there are about twelve thousand bikes. How many docks are there in the city? Is it one to one or is there? Uh, no, it's definitely not one to one. Uh, that uh, there. So it's roughly two to one. Um, I mean, one of the things that. I was shocked by when I when I first interacted with the, the company. They said, "Well, at that point, they were at a different state. There were twelve thousand docks and six thousand bikes, um, and they were very proud of there was twelve thousand bikes and six thousand docks." And they said, "Well, you know, our goal is to start every rush hour with every station half full." Mm. And I thought. I don't think that's really there. Let, let's let's talk in a couple of weeks, which indeed we did, and then then life changed, and indeed you'll 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 hear much more about that. So presumably these people who are dissatisfied customers open this app that you showed us uh, right near the station as they were dissatisfied, checking if a neighboring station has <coughs> bikes. Uh, you get data from someone opening the app? So this is a point I almost made in the middle of Balaji's talk. And, and this is a, the, the chief data science for the MTA in Boston um, sort of highlighted this in my mind. A lot of these public-private entities made the mistake, I mean, they're sort of legislated to do this, of, of making all their, their data public. So what has happened then is that the app support for you know, where's the bus or, or any of these things, has a number of, of, of private apps that are, that are living off of the public feeds. And so, and, and in particular, and I'll be brutally honest, the, the, the City Bike app was really bad initially. Um, none of the, almost all of the users quickly migrated to other feeds for what the data was. And so they don't even know. It's so like Uber knows when an Uber user wants to, you know, use a car. They know when they opened and they didn't and what that meant. We, I mean, it is true that their, their data systems don't actually track opens that don't correspond to, uh, to rents, and it should, um, but it's that it would be missing a lot of that information as well. Okay. One of our, uh, yeah, and so definitely right tone is set. Please just fire away with questions. Uh, yeah. What is, what's the price comparison with, between bikes and dogs? They cost about the same. So, so a bike, well, that, that a, a city bike bike 
uh, order of magnitude, we're talking about $1,000. And the electric, I mean, so the way the dock works is there's the physical piece that's, that, that's just sitting there permanently, but, but, but there's the electromagnetic mechanism that, that really just fires a pin that locks the, the, the bike in place within the th thing. And those are interchangeable. You take, I mean, they get repaired on a very steady basis and, and they cost about $1,000 to manufacture as well. So, so it's, it's about the same. Um, one of the things that we took as a starting point in when we, we first started being optimistic about what we could do is that exactly around this framing of, well, s starting each rush hour in some state and trying to plan around that, uh, that we thought that well, let's just think about the planning period as being a rush hour and then there's some lesser amount of uh, traffic that can allow some amount of recovery between rush hours and then certainly then there's the overnight period which allows sort of a, a better and more complete um, reinitialization. Uh, so one of the first things we, we thought about, well, for simplicity of modeling, if we're going to think about this in a kind of traditional stochastic model kind of way, if we, let's, let's, a first cut of sort of thinking about uh, our data was we believed that it made sense to that think throughout uh, the morning rush hour, although there'll be some variation, but to think about for the intense morning rush hour, to just think about the rate of, for each station, the, the rate of rental is being relatively constant and, and uh, the rate of returns is being essentially constant. And this station shows you how wrong we can be. Because uh, if you look at what's happening through the morning rush, the weekend days are one thing, but on the work days, you see already the, the fill level going straight up um, in the first part of the rush hour and then going smack down in the second half of the rush hour. So you have real turnarounds with it. Now this is a particularly extreme case. It has to do with probably being immediately next to Bellevue Hospital and there may be a staff change that it's, it's really driving. It's also next to an, a, a daycare with drop-offs and pick-offs of kids and, 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 and the like. So there are a range of different complicating factors that might be driving this behavior, but certainly the sense that you have to be sensitive that you have a uh, a pretty narrow window in which things sort of stay the same is, is something one should be sensitive to in terms of the data. Um, coming back to the question earlier of this, this notion of censoring data, we, we, we get to record the trips that occur, but we didn't record the trips that, that, that um, we were missing. Um, so here's a plot of one pretty intense station, really the biggest, the, the mo at, that, at this point in time, the most intense station in the system outside of Penn Station. Um, each row in this plot corresponds to one day in a month. And we have the time axis from midnight to midnight going across the, the x-axis. And for each 10 minute window, um, I'm going to color code from Deep red meaning I'm out of docks. Deep blue meaning I'm out of, out of, out of bikes and sort of the greenish in the middle as being things are basically okay. Um, so sort of with warnings of blue and warnings of red. Um, that, uh, I, mean, and, I mean, of course the, the, the first order bit is there's much more of a problem in being out of bikes than being out of docks here. Uh, but, but notice that if I look at a given 10 minute slice in one part of the day, there are parts, you know, no, even for every part of 10 minute slice, there's some um, fraction of the days for which life is basically okay. And so we can take advantage of the fact of seeing what demand rates are for those dates and in terms of the measurable ones that we have, and therefore just sort of by renormalizing allow us to get a better estimate of what the, uh, the latent demand is. Now, there, there are more serious issues in doing this, and this is, I think, one of the interesting data analytic challenges. Uh, that, that, of course, how a station is perceived by individuals you, in that neighborhood affects their willingness to subscribe, to become active users, and so there, there are other sort of behavioral effects that are, that are also affecting, in some sense, latent demand. But, but this at least gives us a cut in terms of, of users in the system. So this is a tangential but probably relevant to understand what's going on. What's the rebalancing capacity of the system? Can you rebalance all through the day and 
can you rebalance locally typically or do you rebalance across stations far apart? So this is definitely a central question and 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 I'm going to give away my punchline later, uh, but 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 the punchline is the rebalancing capabilities is epsilon. Uh, they're really at least as as, and you can argue that maybe they're not allocating sufficient resources, but in terms of the total resources that that they that they that they actually are are. Uh, from their current business model willing to invest in, they're, they're doing very little rebalancing overall. But we'll talk about exactly what modes of rebalancing and exactly how this comes into decision making um, in running the system. Okay? Good. Um, so to give you a sense of um, the effect of doing this sort of cross-month data cleaning, if you will, um, here are two stations. Um, again, a, a midtown station where we, you know, expect. So here's the question of: on the top, we have a demand for for rentals, and here we have a demand for returns. Um, so this is midtown, so we know that we have a lot of incoming traffic, and uh, that uh, the effect of of using the pure data and the the sensor the the desensored version. Um, in, in the solid line. So, so, so it gives us some ability to correct for, for what, what we're missing because at some point we don't have demand because we don't have um, capacity. How, how is it oh. So again, this is just in some sense a proportionate rescaling okay. by, by taking advantage that they were only measuring demand when we actually conserve it. So, but it's, you don't have actual data? No, which, yeah. no, okay. nope, right. nope. Um, Balaji also talked about the fact of having simulation tools for, for thinking about and, and playing with, 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 with synthetic versions of the system as an important tool in, in trying to understand what's going on. And as part of trying to, to, to build a simulation model, if you sort of think about that system, one thing that oh, is, is sort of key for, for understanding a, a, a one element is, well, if I start at this station and end at, that, at this station, you know, how long is a typical ride? So what you see here is a log-log plot of the distance between stations on the x-axis and the length of the ride uh, on the y-axis. And each point is one, point, is one ride in a day um, of, of that. And that's log base E, and durations are measured in seconds, and, and, and distances are uh, measured in kilometers, uh, and uh, that's one day. And you sort of, you know, it's, it all seems kind of reasonable. No, no, no big surprises there. Um, but that's actually because the eye is bad at such things. Um, this is if I put one month worth of data. Um, all of a sudden, you sort of see kind of an interesting horizontal line that's 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 visible here in terms of intensity. Uh, and you know, it even took us for a, mo a moment to think about, sort of go through what's, what, what does eight correspond to in terms of e to the eight number of seconds. Yeah. People just go from station to station, they don't hang on to a bike? So, the, the, I mean, they do, I mean, so there, here's the punchline. Um, the, the subscription uh, is based on when you're a subscriber, you have 45 free minutes. Um, and that horizontal line is the 45-minute uh, line. So you sort of see, independent of the distance that, that people are, people hang on to their bikes more up to the, the, the point that they get for free. And then when, when that exp expires, then, uh, then they're much e more eager to get it back in. OK? Yes. So exactly that. Um, this may be difficult to see in this, the, in this slide. Um, just to give you some sense of the contrast between weekday usage and uh, weekend usage, uh, these are the top K, and I don't remember exactly the K, maybe 25, um, pair to pair, end to end, uh, most frequently used routes superimposed on each other. Um, the main takeaway message is leisure in Central Park commercial activity in Midtown, right? And you just really see dramatically there in terms of how the, the, the patterns of usage get, get uh, um, differ between the two generic differences, okay? So, so, so again, n not very surprising, but, but the data tells you what, what, what you sort of expect, okay? Okay, so, so that's uh, an overview of, of uh, 
the data, but now let's talk about performance and let's talk about those upset users and how are we going to actually build a model that, that allows us to sort of, as I think about the state of the system, I can ask questions like, is the state good in terms of what I expect in terms of how, how things are performing? Um, and we're going to then, of course, want to use this for planning. And you know, reiterating many of the things I've already hit upon, you know, the heavy, most of the trips are by commuters, um, concentrated um, 6 to 10 a.m. and 4 to 8 p.m. Um, in some sense, it's natural to view a, a daily planning period as 6 a.m. to 12, 12 midnight and, and to think about restarting that. And we want some metric to, to say that how good is our current state as we think about the evolution of, of the day. And the objective that we're going to use as our benchmark uh, is what has been gradually unified across the literature to be called the user dissatisfaction function, is that as I think about some stochastic model of the underlying traffic um, throughout the day, um, it's the expected number of total bike and dock stockouts of, of outages as a user shows up. Um, um, in the remainder of the planning period. So in some sense, very much the, the number of upset users that, that we expect. Okay. What's the, a, a natural model for the underlying setting for, for um, how to think about the traffic? We're going to think about a Poisson flow of, 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 of bikes that, uh, where we can back in the rates from, from our historical data. And each station we're going to think of, and this is indeed a, an assumption which you know, has, can be tested to some extent by um, a, a back-ended si simulation model, of uh, we're going to think about modeling stations using a continuous time Markov chain that are independent for different stations, where the, the <coughs> rates are going to be piecewise constant. In, in particular, we're going to, for every 30 minutes, have a rental and return rate for each station. And again, we're going to then be interested in computing the number of accepts, upset people. So again, you know, I'm thinking about a station. It's, it, it's in a state between being empty and being full. And the arrival is either going to bump me up uh, one state in terms of one more bike um, or, or bump me down in terms of one fewer. And what I'm going to essentially have as an underlying thing is that as a function of the original number of starting number of bikes or the current number of bikes for the rest of the planning period, what's the expected number of outages that I'm going to uh, um, see? Um, again, we originally thought with this, doing this over a, a rush hour, but, but, but because of the data as we saw it, we're going to be thinking about this as sort of in a series of, in this case, 36 um, half hour planning periods as we go between, typically between 6 a.m. and midnight. Um, and, and we're going to have the same model, just, just time dependent. And, and, and I won't go through the mechanics, but it's an easy recursion to say that if I know how to do it for constant um, Poisson rates, I can, can, can do this in a stochastic recursion for throughout the t, t period day. So what do these curves look like? So I now have a cost function. Um, so again, for this plot, um, the x-axis is the number of bikes at 6 a.m. that I currently have. And now I'm thinking about the number of uh, out-of-stock events that happen at that station um, over the rest of the day. Uh, this is outside the Port Authority. So again, you know, this is something where we start out the day with a great surge of rentals. And, and we see that, that really, with a slope of uh, minus one, every additional uh, bike that uh, I uh, have in my docks saves me an expected outage um, there. I want, those I want that dock full. Um, at the Port Authority. And you know, I have some hopeless amount of, of, of outage amounts anyway, um, even if I start with that dock full at 42 or whatever it is. Um, that, that station in Brooklyn um, is still a much more benign kind of station. It, it, it's, uh, um, there is, you know, you want to have some number of, of, of bikes initially, uh, because then you'll actually have some, some outages if you start with too few, but beyond a certain amount going up to that full capacity is, is, is uh, going to give, potentially give you some dock outages. But, but there's this large sweet spot um, in terms of what the right number of uh, bikes that you would want to have in place and, and, and essentially not, never see an outage of, of either side. Um, Midtown is just the reverse of the Port Authority. You, you want it essentially empty, uh, and, or you want it empty, and, and uh, um, for every uh, 
bike you uh, put in there at, at, at 6 a.m., you, you gain an extra outage. Um, and, 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 and all sorts of behavior is visible throughout as you go across the, the suite of stations. And of course, this really sort of says that for each station, there, there is a you know, 6 a.m. target level of, of you know, what's the optimal number of bikes that, that uh, you want in, at that station at that time. Very interesting and, uh, in, and informative in possibly the following way, which is uh, as just even a simulation thing, uh, if we could introduce a, two tiers of service, one with reservation and one yeah. not. Yep. So you can call ahead like previous night. In the app stuff, you can do this. Probably, so the way you're smiling, you probably have done some. Well, I've thought about it. <laughs> yeah. so the reason I'm saying this is that something like this came up in the city bus, uh, if you're moving like uh, two million passengers and some of them want seats. With apps now, you can you can assign bus combinations for them to change right? and so on with seats assigned. Uh, and that's actually something the cities are willing to listen to just because it's, uh, there's enough people who pay an interesting premium for it. And so, just a thought. Yes, indeed. You'll see it on a slide at towards the end as sort of things that, that are interesting and to come. But yeah, so they're, they're really this 2x, 3x yeah. Thing. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. So 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 that was the snapshot at 6 a.m. Um, so now for these plots, rather than thinking about an absolute capacity, um, let me renormalize because I'm going to be looking at each of these colors as a different station. So this is just the fraction of of uh, of the docks that we want full. And as I think about optimizing over the next, to the end of the, the midnight planning period, for each of these times, what's the optimal bike allocation for that time um, as in minimizing the, the, the outages? And again, you sort of see two highest level pieces that, that of course, the East Village, which is residential in one of these places where there are great outflows, that, 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 that we really want to keep things stocked until people stop going. And it actually is much later than, than, than I mean, um, the East Village is usually referred to as a bike desert um, by 9 AM, let alone uh, the, the midnight that, that the models would, would like us to keep it filled. Um, and the financial district, of course, you, you know, the, the point where you really need them is, is on the way home and that you want it empty um, for arrivals. But notice that in some sense, both sort of say that, that, that you want some residue, that there's some local amount of traffic that, that it's needed within the financial district, even in the wee hours of the morning um, that, 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 that's, that, that the models are calling for. Yeah. Um, how significant is the coupling effect between stations for this? for this metric which you're trying to minimize? Uh, so again, based on doing things that, that, that don't sort of have the separation, uh, uh, the fact that we're viewing them as independent doesn't seem to be too bad. Um, it, it, it's a, it is a, There is an effect. Um, but because, of course, if Penn Station is out, then, then places that, that normally receive bikes from Penn Station are going to see a diminution of, of incoming traffic, and then it's going to ripple. So, so there, there are natural effects to, to, to be thinking about, but, but they, they are second and third order. Uh, one more plot on data. Uh, so and it's nice to focus on things like Midtown and uh, Penn Station where the asymmetries are clear. But in this plot, so this is a scatter plot. Each dot corresponds to one station. And we're looking at, well, what's, what does our um, uh, user dissatisfaction say about the fraction that should be filled at 7 AM versus what should be filled at 4 AM? And, and see there. So I mean, the, the, the upper left corner are those things where you know, your Penn Station, where you really want to go out and it's going to be empty there. This is Midtown um, or Financial District. Um, but you see that there's a, a diversity um, across the, the set of stations in terms of that, that asymmetry, which is predominant in terms of, of how the flow is, is not, is not the whole story. Um, so, uh, so. Okay, so, so, so now we have a metric to think about um, how to evaluate performance. We understand the data. How are we actually going to do some of the decision making that's, that's involved? Well, the first thing is that if I just and I, I had a target for each station. Um, of course, 
a natural thing would be, well, can I just achieve all of, the, all of those targets simultaneously? The answer is unfortunately not, that there that actually aren't enough bikes in the system to do that at 6 a.m. So, so what's the right allocation? And so this gives rise to a math programming model. It's a, you know, an integer program. Um, not surprising as you looked at those curves, those cost functions are convex. Um, this is, this is an a optimization problem which does achieve its optimum and it, 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 it is easily computable. Um, and uh, so we can use this as the basis for uh, the allocation of bikes. Um, but life evolves through the day, and the question is exactly how much you know, we can accomplish through rebalancing effects. And, that, and, 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 and I'm going to talk about five different ways in which uh, we make decisions to affect the performance of the system throughout the day. Um, so mid-rush rebalancing. One, one mechanism by which the rush hour uh, rebalancing occurs, which took us by surprise, is that trucks, OK, maybe should, we shouldn't have been so surprised, also have problems moving around at rush hour. Uh, and so doing a lot of motorized rebalancing um, then can be pretty ineffective. Um, not just traffic, access to some I mean, how much they can block a side street um, with a truck to unload, uh, their, their issues. So what they went to in, in to sig significant effect are these trikes. Um, so the, these are pedicabs where the back part of this can be used to load up uh, city bikes. And the New York City is particularly um, amenable to this kind of thing because there are pairs of stations that are relatively close physically that are diametrically opposite in terms of the patterns of, 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 of behavior. So if you look at Grand Central, you know, that's at 42nd and whatever. Uh, and, and, and you look at Midtown at, let's say, 44th and 5th, there, there may be two avenue blocks and a couple st streets apart, but, but they, they, they look just the opposite. So you can have this cyclist, this is outside Grand Central, uh, who was exactly cycling between those two stations, uh, and can load up bikes at one end and, and unload them at the other. Okay. Now they had a given limited resource. Uh, yeah. What's the distance you said, David, between the two? So it would take him about six minutes to ride between the, the, the pair of stations. And he could weave amongst traffic. And, and so, so even if traffic was stopped, he, he managed to go back and forth. So I, I wouldn't want the job, but so for this pair. Um, that, uh, um, so these trikes can hold up to, depending on the design, this one could do six. There, there are versions that can hold up to 12. Um, but of course, we want to there. And the question now is a purely offline decision making problem first uh, is, you know, what, you know, if I'm thinking about allocating uh, the, the, the eight or so trikes that they have, you know, where should they allocate them? And, and we can take the same, and I won't go through the details, but you can imagine things, is it, for, for every pair of stations, as you sort of think about the unraveling of what happens over the rush hour, how many trips can you make, and how does that affect the user dissatisfaction function um, as it evolves over the course of that, uh, that morning's rush hour, you, you can ascribe uh, an anticipated improvement in the user dissatisfaction function at the two endpoints associated with pairing that uh, um, trike across those things. Now you could say that, that that's probably not the right thing to do because maybe you want to do that for a while and you want to do some other pair. Um, but uh, for, unfortunately also the, the, the pliability of the maintenance staff is, is one thing and giving them simple directions to just simply go back and forth between a given pair um, was, was highly appealing to management. Yeah. Just curious, is, is the guy paid piecework or hourly? He's paid hourly. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so, so what this amounts to when you when you go through all the the, the modeling is that you end up you have a, a you have a bipartite graph that 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 you have you know some stations that are are suppliers of bikes you have some stations that are that are consumers of bikes and for each 
pair that's sufficiently close that, that, that it makes sense to even compute the, the, the weight of improvement, there's a total improvement over the rush hour that you can do, and we can compute a maximum weight um, um, K edge matching, and, and indeed, um, there, there, there's a display of one such uh, solution. There are, there are two stations with diametrically opposite patterns a few blocks apart. Mm -hmm. Why not build one station in the middle between them? Good question. Um, well, because one is at Grand Central, and, and, and people use the system in a variety of ways. And I think the biggest use is what would typically be called last mile, except it's not last mile, it's last few hundred feet. Uh, <laughs> uh, that, 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 uh, that the, if you look at the distribution of the, the distance between pairs of stations um, in terms of how often they get used, stations that are very close get, get an enormous fraction, I mean, a surprisingly large fraction of, 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 of the use. But, but is that people who are actually riding from one station to another, or is it they have an errand across town, and when they come back, they just leave it at a slight I don't difference. think so. Because among other things, you don't have an easy locking mechanism while you're uh, in doing the, the errand across town. Um, you're disincentivized in terms of the maximum budget that you have on time. You know, the, 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 any number of ways that you would expect the data, they're going to let go of the bike and try to claim another one. Now, of course, they could be at a place where there isn't availability, but, but um, there. Okay. Do you think changing the 45 minutes free time to 60 minutes free time would alter the behavior to an extent that you won't have to put in so much of effort in rebalancing? No. 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 Um, no I, maybe I'm just, I, I don't, I think rebalancing is mostly a function of of, of asymmetry of, of demand and the length of time is, is, isn't, isn't the, the isn't the uh, the relevant piece? It sounds like there is a room for some kind of an incentive system. We'll get there. We are. It's there. It's in place. You know, <laughs> give me fifteen, you know, you know, twenty-five minutes. You know. <laughs> uh, I mean, I even told you it was coming. It was number five on that list. So uh, overnight rebalancing. So so that's a box truck. It can hold about 50 bikes. There are a fleet of about five of them. Yes, only five of them that, 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 that they have. Um, they start each night at, at, at their headquarters in, in Sunset Park in Brooklyn, and uh, which is in itself part of the problem in that they spend about an hour to two hours every day just getting to where the action is, let alone not rebalancing bikes. Um, and, uh, and, and most of the rebalancing occurs in this 11 p.m. to 6 a.m. shift. Um, and then there are all kinds of logistical things that because they're big trucks, because this is Manhattan, they can't get to certain stations, because they can't get reasonably close, you name it, there are all kinds of issues. But the goal is clear. We have a limited amount of time. They have to be back at uh, the depot at 6 a.m. and we want to maximize the improvement in the system there. Um, and, and this can be done through a series of integer programming tricks. I won't go through them, um, but, 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 but nonetheless, that, that, that as an offline tool, um, that, uh, that this is one of the things that, that's, that's had substantial effect. Uh, yeah. Quick question. So if you start day one and say with an optimal allocation mm -hmm. and you don't have to rebalance during the day, so how bad is it at the beginning of the next day? Good. Uh, we'll talk about that. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, so, so you might say, well, where's the real-time decision making? I have to say the thing started out really very primitive. The first thing that we were able to do was we put in, there is a human dispatcher sitting at headquarters. Um, and the, the first thing is that this metric allowed us to be able to sort of put up warning signs of stations that are um, out of bikes. Now, in fact, and, and for a while I thought this was private, but I just found it on the public website so I can talk about it openly, is that there is a notion called never die stations, um, that 10% of all stations are, 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 have a special designation. Um, that, that are how they come into the service agreement between uh, Motivate and uh, the city of New York. And of course, there are steeper penalties for those never die stations and therefore more serious attention uh, paid to the, those stations. So, so there's a dispatch map which sort of says that 
for the dispatcher's point of view that, that, that are, are we in, in jeopardy of paying fines for, for being out of bikes? And then the question is, where do we send the truck to get the bikes from? And, and so now at least we have the, 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 the measurement tools to say, here are at least the, the stations that, that uh, a, di a dispatcher could say, oh, let's just go grab them from, uh, from, from this station. It's relatively nearby. And that was really the, the first, it was still a big improvement over what was done before because there was some quantitative basis for it. But, but, uh, um, but nonetheless, that's where things started. What happens now? So the, there's a heuristic tool that, that we've designed uh, that essentially allows the dispatcher to have a display that, that for each truck that's out on the streets has a prefix of where that truck should go given current information that gets updated over time. And again, the this, this prefix is, is uh, done in a simple, you know, greedy, ra with randomization thrown in on top of it, heuristic point of view of, again, what's the goal? If I'm going to route five trucks over the next two hours, how's the m best improvement that I can get over those two hours in terms of going from the system state in an untouched way to the system in, in an improved way? And, uh, in fact, the heuristic keeps generating solutions in the background. The dispatcher doesn't get disturbed by changes too often, only when there's sort of another event uh, in the system that, uh, or uh, some lesser periodicity. Um, this gives you a sense of the, the look and feel. There's a map piece. There's, a, there's, a, there's you know, for each truck. And then there, there's sort of a, an itinerary displayed, and, and there are warning signals of what kind on, on different stations. But, 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 but this is, so, so this is now real-time decision making um, done automatically, exactly guided by uh, the, the, the user dissatisfaction functions. Oh, I forget who asked this question. Yeah, you see the path. Um, so, but what can I say about the effect of overall balancing? Now, this is before that the latest round of tools went into place. So, I'm, I'm hoping that maybe life is a little better. But here is a graph that shows. So, this is this again because I can tell by the where there are stations is is last summer is summer of 16. Um, for each of these circles, how red it is says how far that station is from where it should be at 6 a.m. the next morning. Okay, so white would mean we're already at the level that we want, we don't need any rebalancing. Deep red means that I have a lot of rebalancing to, to be done. So that's where we are at midnight. Let's see where we are at 6 a.m. And I'm sure all of you think that I just showed you the same map. Uh, oh, okay, there's some places where there's some level of improvement. I can point out, but it, it's very limited in terms of it's it's a very and this is this is um, um, this is a problem. So just simply, it, we're not able to go for the the the. the targeted levels with the current number of size of the fleet of trucks. And we need different techniques in order to, to uh, do that. Um, so one could ask the question of maybe this, yeah, yeah, this one thing. The rebalancing trucks also take up bikes from excess stations where there were, like, there were full of bikes, but they did not need so much. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah, yes. Um, so, so one question is, is the system designed right? I mean, so, so all of the, you know, the design, I mean, we saw this Brooklyn station, which had more than 60 docks, and, and it seemed to be ludicrous. And, and so, so one question is that how much could we be really improving the system uh, by, by a completely different system design, uh, or somewhat different system design? The docks are not welded to the pavement. They actually are just heavy pieces of machinery sitting on top of the pavement. So a crane can come lift it up onto a flatbed and move it to some other part of the city. They actually come in groups of three and four. Uh, so, uh, so, you, so you actually have the ability to, to reconfigure the existing hardware. Um, and since, you know, as Anton asked, that, that, that bikes and docks are roughly the same order of magnitude in terms of cost, they're, they're, they are expensive. So are we really, you know, we're spending all this energy on, on rebalancing bikes, but, but, but maybe we should be getting the, the, the system design right. Um, so this gives us rise to a, you know, a, a similar optimization problem for the daily one. Um, and 
I won't go through the details, but, but it's, it's not hard to imagine that, that we now have a cost that's, that's now a function of, for each station, how many um, empty docks and how many full docks do I have? And I have a total allocation of docks. I have uh, a total allocation of bikes. And we can even sort of think of this as an augmentation problem that suppose I want to think about going from my current allocation to uh, uh, a different allocation and I place some limit on the number of changes that I could place because telling the city that you're, we want you to move all you know, X thousand by, uh, docks, they aren't going to go for that. So let's, you know, what about a targeted number? And of course for each station there, there are some amount of capacity constraints and minimum uh, size that, that they're willing to think about. Turns out that this is a solvable problem. The underlying objective function, each, each term is, is a, has a property known as multimodularity, uh, which is a kind of diminishing returns property. Uh, and uh, as a result, we're able to show that as a mathematical optimization problem, there's lots of nice structure. In particular, if I think about the space of all allocations of bikes and docks, um, across the, the system, and I think about a neighborhood structure on the set of all those solutions. So now each complete system-wide solution is a node in your graph, and two uh, nodes, two allocations are neighbors if you can get to one from the other by a simple change. Let's say I move a dock from one station to another. I move a bike in a dock to, from one station to another, or I just move a bike, or a bit more complicated, I take a bike from one station and a dock from another, and I put them together at a, a, at a third location. So those are all sort of local changes that I can make, and, and, and that gives rise to a neighborhood structure on solutions. Yeah? Just, just to check, there's sure. a fixed notion of real estate? Yes, so... so and which has a cost? Uh, so part of the thing goes back to the political layer, that there are long, complicated no negotiations of, 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 of neighborhood organization groups within the city that, that have, have come to an agreement of where the stations are going to be located and what the bounds for how many, what the upper and lower bounds for that station could be, and that's given. And, and yes, one could try to go back and fight, but that, that's, 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 that's a level that, that, that I really don't want to go into. Okay, so, so this gives a, and, and, and the, the nice mathematical structure underneath it is that local optimality equals global optimality here. That if I simply find a solution for which there isn't an improving move with respect to these small changes, then in fact that, that you can prove that that's the global optimum with respect to the, the coordination problem across all stations. Um, and this actually, if you push the same idea a bit further, gives rise that you can solve the problem by a kind of greedy gradient descent kind of algorithm where you simply want to start with your current solution and check to see if there's an improving move and make the best improving move um, that you can and then and show that, that that then leads to the optimal solution. And in fact, you can therefore show that if you're going to move at most k docks, that this can, can give rise to the best solution. Um, uh, achievable where you're only allowing yourself to move in most k-docs. Um, there's an interesting sort of theoretical computer science subtlety that what's the size of the input here? Um, and you sort of think about you know, a, a solution that's moving one bike at a time. Um, did you're ending up with something that's proportional to the number of bikes and docks in the system? Um, but as theoretical computer scientists, we're trained that if I think about specifying the input to the problem, then if I want to say how many bikes there are, um, then I only need log the number of bikes bits to specify that input rather than that. So in some sense, this is not a polynomial number of iterations. Um, and one could imagine analogous versions of this problem where the commodities are digital and that you could be. The first easy solution is to say that my bike fleet is given to me in unary. I count one bike, two bikes, three bikes, four bikes, and, 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 and therefore it's okay. But actually uh, one can prove that, that there's an improved version of the algorithm where just in terms of the number of oracle calls to the, cost, to the user dissatisfaction functions, you can reduce the dependence to be logarithmic on the, the number of bikes and docks in the system. Okay. I forget who asked this question. Uh, Anton asked, you know, why don't I just not do anything? So here's a model that I could think about not doing anything. Uh, think of it as sort of the long-term average. Just imagine that I'm running the, 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 uh, the stochastic model of, of where things are until I reach a steady state. Okay? 
And now suppose I'm thinking about optimizing what the system should get designed for in those terms rather than in terms of the fact that I'm sort of thinking about with a Harry Potter magic wand, every night I'm going to get to my, my perfect state the next, by the next morning. What's the nicest thing that could happen to me from an allocation point of view? Well, it sort of did happen, is that optimizing with respect to this function is not so different in terms of the kind of system that I, I want to configure, is not so different than if I actually think about what I'm doing in terms of the uh, um, optimal rebalancing. And indeed, um, well, I guess I'm not running out of time. So uh, we did an experimental design based on New York data that, that, that allows us to do a series of, of, of comparisons. Uh, let's take one month's worth of data. Let's optimize the system with respect to the day, one day um, optimum and what's the right system of, of docs. And then let, we can evaluate that doc allocation with both respect to what happens with the long-term average and, there, and, and, and also try to understand the effect of how many docs would it take to get better performance. So I've confused the design a little bit because I'm now trying to do two things at once. That I'm first trying to get some understanding of what kind of effect would moving docs have on overall system performance? And then the question of how might I measure that effect, both in terms of the protocol where I'm thinking about rebalancing perfectly overnight versus I'm thinking about not doing any rebalancing at, at all. So without, yeah. re without rebalancing, when you run that process forward and a bike gets to a station without a dock, where do you put that bike? Uh, so um, we, we make it disappear from the system, basically. Simulations allow us to do magical things, right? Uh, good. So, so, so the, this is uh, the, the first step in, in this experiment. Um, so now if I think about um, the number of docs that I'm allowing to move, um, how many docs do, do I want to move in total, and how much improvement can I get overall? So here are the... Uh, the, the sort of punchlines. So this is off of June 2015 data. That we end up with 1,200 fewer out-of-stock events, um, which is about 30% of the uh, original, um, by redesigning the system completely. Um, the number of docs needed to be moved um, is was 1,600, which was at that point about 17% of the, the total number of docs, but. But on the other hand, there's sort of this is a phenomenon of di diminishing returns, and so if I only move 500 docs, so two and a half uh, percent of the overall system, I get to a level of improvement of, of objective that's comparable to what City Bike thinks they gain by all of their motorized rebalancing um, efforts, daytime, overnight, whatsoever. Um, so that this one-time event uh, can, can accomplish the same order of magnitude um, than that, 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 that all of the, and of course the two things are not orthogonal, we, we can get sort of the improvements from, from both. That one-time event is consistent with political commitments? Yes, yes. So this is all within the range of, of, of there. Now in fact, this happened, I mean we didn't get 500 docs moved, we got a small number of docs moved. Um, but, but, but in fact, they, they have been moving docs so as to improve the overall design of the system according to uh, the, the, uh, the models that we've been running. Yeah. Oh, no, OK. So why is it difficult to move more docs? Politics. I mean, there, there are also bigger issues that, which we'll talk about um, coming up. Uh, that, uh, that, that that come into play of sort of why they may they still for them might not be the right issues to be focusing on at this moment in time. Yeah. What's the, um, the rebalancing capacity in terms of you know bike slots in all trucks used? Uh, I my I mean again I'm now going back off of that that, that something of the order of a couple thousand bikes get get touched over the course of a day. Okay, so at any one time it's maybe a hundred or two 
Oh, at any given moment yeah, in time? Oh, so capacity. total capacity is like 400 across the entire fleet. There are maybe three or four sprinters and five box trucks. So, so yeah. Um, and then this. So, David, just to, yeah. This is after learning the pattern of usage yes. over a certain period of time. Yep. And when you move this 20 million number at the end of this last year, because you went up to 14 million, now 20. Yeah. So, so, so now if we're measuring what the level of improvements looks like across other months of traffic, we still get improvements. So, so the fact that we made the design decision once and, and, and there, and also the, the difference between the C and the C pi, or this is the long-term average where I'm not doing any rebalancing, um, which is probably a fair 30,000 feet view. Again, the same, I mean, the, 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 the fine tuning of exactly what these functions look like is about the same, but, but the, the by and large, the same improvements happen. So the, the meta message is, please move these docs. Um, so one other way in which, and this, this happened at, at about the same time, is that uh, when, when this system was first set up, it was well, I mean, it was immediately obvious that there was this tremendous inflow into the financial district. There was a great amount of focus on this, partly because that's where their investors were all working. Uh, and and, and, and they, that they were, it was painfully visible um, that, that docs were unavailable instantly. And, and one thing that no one asks today, but always somebody asks is, but wait, it isn't the same thing to be missing a bike as to be missing a dock, because I have to return the, Bike. Um, so, so, so there, there are real issues here. Um, so, one thing they did is they planted a box truck um, within the financial district at 6 a.m. So that when the first round of bikes uh, filled up one dock, they unloaded that dock onto the truck and then they drove it away. But then they had to drive that truck back at 3 p.m. So as to fill the, not a good idea. So they came up with this idea of a corral, which basically said that we were granted the right to use this real estate as a result of, of, of running this program. We're going to use it more effectively so that there's enough space between a pair of physical docks that you can stack a few extra bikes literally on top of each other um, there and then lock them down. So, so that there would be someone who would maintain this and, and maintain that it was locked. And you could more or less quadruple the capacity of a station. Um, and actually still by keeping a few docks sort of normal, that, that the, the sort of transient day, middle of the day usage could still be left unencumbered. But, but you'd be able to get, get, get much greater usage out of uh, um, the station as well. A human does that. A human, do, a human does that, yes, yes. So, so then there was a the question of how many humans they were willing to allocate to do this and how do you space this? And again, we could build models. It gave rise to a nice facility location problem. Um, and, and, and indeed, that's what determines uh, um, how they staff um, and, and where they put them. And, and indeed, I think these are still to this day where uh, um, those, those, those corrals are, are located. OK, now, a lot of this is driven, and a lot of the issues and how operation by City Bikes pricing scheme, which is just completely stupid. I mean, the scheme is just set up to fail. Um, and this is true across um, all of, I mean, North, I mean, this is what Motivate negotiated with, with, with uh, the city of New York, but, but, but any number of, of these, there are uh, several North American firms that have come into agreements with, with a variety of urban centers, and they all have more or less the same structure. You can buy a one-day pass or a three-day pass for a small amount of money, or you can buy an annual subscription, which is an all-you-can-eat kind of thing. And it just gives you unlimited access to the system. Uh, in New York, if you look at how different users use it, I mean, the key users get a sweet deal. Those traders in the East Village who go to the financial district, I mean, they use it well more than 100 of the time. There isn't good public transportation between their two endpoints. They probably were taking taxis, or maybe they had switched to Uber um, that, uh, um, at that point. Um, but, uh, um, they're paying, you know, under a buck a ride, really under half a buck a ride, typically, uh, 
and 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 this in itself is sort of a, a destabilizing fact. And and just if you know you know biology talked about this, you know it, it's it's charging for what it really would be worth to people would have changed. I mean, it would give you more, give them many, much more resources to be able to do the kind of re rebalancing. But it, very much inspired by biology's work, we proposed to. Um, uh, city bike that we implement a, an incentive scheme. Um, that, and part of the thing comes into, and this also comes to the reservation question, is that the way the contract works for, for between Motivate and the city of New York is they are guaranteed, guaranteeing providing this kind of subscription plan. And this way, someone asks a question of why not just differential pricing? Incentives they can ask add without violating the contract at all. They can. They, it's just a, a an added bonus on top of thing. It doesn't change the pricing scheme, but it's a way of implementing differential pricing, uh, without having to you know get the city's okay. And the city, you know, they there are regular conversations with the DOT, so that they knew it was coming. It's not like it came as a surprise, uh, but uh, but but it, it really was an interesting layer. And just. Uh, very interesting small add-on to this. When it flips around, uh, so when they raise the bond, the uh, issue bonds to get the Bay Bridge upgrade, 800 million, they told me the op because it flips around now because the city owes this uh, money to private companies because the bonds have been raised against collections that are expected and promised to be a certain level. They said we can't add an incentive portion now because then I would be reneging on the bond terms. I see. So this is, this is interesting, you know, the private company is doing the collection of money, the city is very happy to let you go and sit Yeah, yeah that's, that's interesting. I mean, it could be just that the DOT didn't think hard enough about whether, you know, what they really should think. Uh, basically, they allowed it to go forward and life was good. And, and we started, yeah. So, yeah, so you, and from going from this to differential pricing, doesn't that seem to be, you, like, isn't there kind of like a thing in between just of just non-differential pricing to try first? Because like this is an enormous discount for riding really often. So just have a fixed. Uh, so so ride. but the point is that I, I'm not gonna give a discount for riding often. I'm gonna give a discount for making rides that we know are good. I, didn't, I mean this system is or is giving a discount for riding often because it's a day pass. Right. Oh, whatever. So, like, I mean, is there not even like a much simpler thing to try in the middle, which is just a fixed price per ride? Yeah, but uh, that would require the DOT buying into it, and 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 I mean, there are various fictions that the city likes to believe, um, which is that this is about egalitarian urban transit. Um, in spite of the fact that it's painfully obvious of if you look at the demographics of the locations where the stations are, um, there are noticeable differences depending on what neighborhood and what the demographic characteristics of those neighbors are. So there are a lot of falsehoods that are sort of built into, you know, we're pretending that things are not as, as easy as they are. And, and anyway, so, so there now is, this is off of the City Bike webpage, a, a program called Bike Angels, which is exactly an incentive system. The, the first cut at this, we did something really, just to give you a sense of the power of incentives in a small anecdotal way, is that there were a pair of stations, exactly like this, proposing the middle one, which were relatively close. One was stressed, one wasn't, um, in the usual commute traffic flow way. We targeted all of the users who had used either of the two stations in the last some period of time, I forget what, um, and we sent, we split them into two random samples. Um, we split, sent half of them just an, an, an email saying, you might consider using this other station because it, it more readily has more bikes uh, in the morning. Um, and the other we sent along with, and if you do, you'll get entered into a lottery for a prize. Amazing difference in terms of how people actually responded. And this was our hook. I mean, we, we, we sort of hoped that this was the case, that, 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 that Motivate would be willing to play along. I mean, we had read Balaji's papers. We knew that this was going to happen. So, so that, 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 uh, that, that, uh, that a little, little bit of, a little nudge goes a long way. Uh, yeah. Inform, informing and incentivizing is just a stunning difference. Yeah. 
Um, so, so what's the nature of the system currently is that every station uh, is either left neutral or left incentivized for a pickup or incentivized for a drop off. Um, in fact, there could be a multi-point drop off. I mean, sort of, it could be really highly incentivized for a pickup. It's it's purely additive between the the two endpoints, so that you, you can get a, ben, a bonus at one and be neutral at the other end, and uh, and you can keep doing it over the course of a rush hour. Okay, so 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 this is the system. It's gamified in in you know how many points you get. There's a leaderboard in terms of the this month of how many points you've actually accrued. Um, there, there are some featured bike angels who, you know, say cute things like, I like to do a bike angels workout where I'll both bike north and Central Park to an empty station, then run back down the park and repeat a few times. Uh, <laughs> um, anyway, so, uh, so, so this is real. Um, and this is its impact. Um, so, so in version one, uh, which was done with a, with, 10% of, of all users were invited to participate in the pilot program. 1% actually uh, signed up. Um, and then there was simply a static map. We didn't, you know, we didn't touch the map over the course of you know, every morning rush hour looked exactly the same. Every afternoon rush hour looked exactly the same. Not the right thing to do. We knew it wasn't the right thing to do, but it was what we could admit. We knew it was light. We, we, at least we kept our fingers crossed that nothing too bad would happen. Um, and each of these dots is, an, is, 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 is a ride that one of those pilot users took. Um, uh, and uh, what you're seeing is that the, the, the time in the ride across the morning rush hour, and, and notice that, that we were doing incentivization off a huge time window from, from 6, 6 a.m. To, to, to noon, um, where you know, it, it's not clear. And you see a lot of blue means that, that, that uh, you know, you shouldn't have done it. Red means it was good. Um, and uh, this was sort of retrospectively um, in terms of that. But, but the message is overwhelmingly, we got people to do um, more good rides. Now, then there's the question of, 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 and to some extent, you can do based on people's behavior as they, in the first two weeks they join, of what they did in the previous two weeks. So you can do all the usual kinds of testing um, to get a sense of what the impact is. With respect to sort of the terms of service here, how do you, how do you how do you write the original agreement to say? Oh, I don't write. I don't well, write. <laughs> you you may not be asked to participate in in incentive programs that other people are asked asked to participate in. If there's this differential, if it's if it's not. So we actually so actually some number of people participated who weren't asked. Um, and that was all just fine. Uh, so this was this was just because they didn't want to. I mean, they were tentative about how they so were. You can always launch this as a limited trial for a certain group to be rolled out of the city more widely. This is how you do these things. That is, in fact, how the terms of service are written. That you may be invited. To, it's experimentally invited to participate in some programs that may eventually succeed. Okay. So my takeaway is that that's a that's a term a clause to watch out for. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it's only relevant for the people who get invited. I mean, often these things that, yeah, they, you don't really, people don't read terms of service that much. Yeah. <laughs> and if someone complains and you just add them, if, you know, if the trial is flexible enough, you have to just add them. So this was summer of 16. Um, summer of 17, we started doing um, smarter uh, things. So each station, under the right set of conditions, it's easy to prove that for each rush hour, there should be one continuous interval. Uh, that, that, that you're incentivizing that and you can make a determination, either you do it in a static way based on the 6 a.m. level as to what the interval that gets incentivized for that station today, or you can simply do it as a real time every 30 minutes, am I willing to shut the incentivization down, start it up or, or um, in the end start it, shut it off. And, and you know, there are a number of experiments and this, the analogous pictures are getting much better because you, are, you, know, you, you aren't doing things where you already know it's stupid. And in general, it's not surprising that, I mean, you're, you're living a little bit on a knife's edge for one of these really busy uh, stations that as you get to the middle of the day, the polarity is going to switch in terms of what that station should be like. And if the last thing you want to do is be stocking yourself, encouraging an extra bike, which you're going to be ruining that is actually there come, come the afternoon. So, so, so there is this delicacy of exactly where it's OK to keep things going as you get, get towards the end of that rush hour. Here's an odd 
real-time decision that we, we only recently started paying, we were asked to, to, to come up with something that works and, and actually we don't have good things to say. So you open your app and you're at home and you, you decide, you want to decide, should I go to this station to, to pick up a bike? One thing you'd sort of like is some warning signal, hey, this station is at risk. Now, the, the regular user has a way of knowing it's at risk. It's empty or it's near empty. But, but after all, we should be able to do better, right? That, so one natural thing, and it's, I'm sure half of you have already thought about in the 10 seconds since I said it, is that if you think about the net flow rate that occurs at that station, and just think of that as a, a fluid model, that rather than thinking about it in the stochastic Poisson sense, just think about it sort of draining at whatever, or filling at that, 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 that fractional rate, um, you know, does it reach some threshold of, of near emptiness or near fullness um, there? Um, it's not clear that on the real data this is helping so much, and, and this sort of, want to pose a sort of philosophical question of that this is a, a first order method, right? You're really just thinking of the net flow uh, as, 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 as the, the big thing. And that net flow is the difference of two, two quantities, the, the renting rate and the, the, the return rate. And, uh, and if you sort of think of it sort of resulting net flow being delta, it, it might have arisen as sort of a big plus delta minus big, or it might have arisen for a little plus delta minus little. Now, usually from a stochastic point of view, you sort of think about, well, big has both sort of a, a you know, a, a centrality and a possibility of more extreme events kind of phenomenon. Um, there's also the fact that if you are at a, the big, you're, you're at a more active station and you know, you, maybe you could wrestle that, that bike away from, from, from those users anyway. And so it's not in clear, either from a theoretical point of view or that how you want to think about what the role of the variance, although I'm not really, don't mean variance, but some sort of sec second order term should be. And, and I think this is, I mean, this just sort of as, as a toy simple question, I, I, this is something that should have a nice clean solution that really does well on data and I don't know how to do it. Um, so a few more questions. Uh, in this system, this dockless, in dock-based bike. So, well, as you already asked earlier, you know, as I talked about the service level agreements and th that uh, the providers are committed to the system they have, but they can add other, you know, possible structures on top of it as long as they don't take away the others. So they, you know, could they have a platinum user? Um, charge that user four times as much, but allow that user to make reservations. Now there are political optics and they're still working, but, but again, how you think about all of the pricing questions and all of the operations questions becomes much more challenging. And you want to be able, before you advise an entity such as this, you, you want to have a sense of, of the implications and have the right models. And I think these are all great questions to think about. There's some work out there, but, but, uh, but exactly how you, you know, it, it opens up the field that you can do all kinds of different pricing mechanisms as long as you're dealing with those platinum users. And, and, and I think this is really a, a, a nice suite of questions that are that, uh, there. Sorry, just one, the one slide before this big was just one roll of variants. Yeah. Uh, I mentioned the taxi you know, in the few thousand, so you know the fluctuations are small right. they're there, but you know it looks pretty much like a fluid model. Uh, for mass transit, it pretty much looks like that. Or for the the Chinese. Yeah, the next slide. Model. Next slide. <laughs> numbers that you may want. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <sighs> okay. But OFO, as Balaji just mentioned, the, the new, new thing. Um, docs are passe. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, maybe docs are passe. So all the North American systems are built around this notions of stations with docs and, and, and people rented one or the other. But two startups in China, both by now unicorns, billion dollar valuations, OFO and Mobike, um, are running systems where you can pick up any bike anywhere, 
open your app, see where there are bikes. It'll recommend a few to you. It'll incentive, Memo Bike has an incentive system, so, so it'll even say you get a little red envelope on some, which is bigger red envelope. It's even more important for you to, to pick up that bike and, uh, and then return it, you know, stop riding it where you want, hopefully not in the middle of the road and you know, all kinds of other things. Um, but uh, but th this, you know, changes the playing field completely. So a little bit of a warning. Mechanisms. So the, the, the brake, I mean, it becomes a p very heavy paperweight um, uh, unless you've l unlocked it on your weight. So it basically it locks to itself. The app allows you to release the braking mechanism and therefore then you can start riding it. However, if you Google bike graveyard, <laughs> these are the pictures that you see. Um, um, it is a big public menace at this point in China in terms of how the systems are getting used. They're still getting used. I mean, there are more, I mean, as someone who visited Beijing um, first, 15, 20, somewhere between 15, 20 years ago, and you know, it was a, a, a city of tremendous bicycle traffic. Um, it's still a city of bicycle traffic, but there are more bike share bikes on the road than there are privately held bikes on the road in Beijing. So just complete shift in terms of um, how the systems get run. Um, but there's tremendous amount of work now to be done. I mean, exactly that we, we, we have a good understanding of the kinds of models that how traffic flows, and there's starting, of course, to be lots of papers being written about what, how, to, how to model traffic, but I, I, I don't think it's there. How do we think about doing incentives and how, how we think about pricing these kinds of rides so as to, to make things, and, and really the question is, how much is the concept of having centralized parking absolutely imperative for maintaining the operations of these systems. Maybe the, the natural thing and the, the stable point is to derive an incentive system that, show, that drives an overwhelming fraction of the traffic to be between centralized stations, but then still allows where people are willing to pay more and be, you know, be uh, uh, therefore able to park sort of in a more dispersed manner. But what's the right to, um, way in which, which this system, because there are clearly operational questions that, that, and operational needs in, in, in how, how a system like this gets run effectively. And it also comes into play, when, when, when bike sharing first started being concerned, uh, considered by operations people, it almost was called the soccer curve problem because the first visible uh, um, bike sharing program was in Paris and soccer curve was always empty um, at the uh, end of the day because it was uphill and, and from everywhere else and so everyone rode downhill. New York, where I have to admit most of my experience is, is especially over the, where the large piece of the footprint that, that, that City Bike currently operates, is, is more or less topography free. It's not, it's not completely flat, but it's not San Francisco, where again, we're gonna be, you know, they're, they're just rolling out um, the tenfold expansion of, of Go Bike in, and, and exactly how this is going to be managed and it'll be interesting to see the data. So it's, you know, what is the effect of topography um, and, 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 and dock-based dock systems versus dockless ones and, and you know, how we uh, should, should evaluate the topography is again, I think a big, big challenge. And that's all I wanna say. So happy to take questions. Yeah, Steve. So does the system have data on the users? That yes. Does, so if 80 or 90% of people that are pretty regular, right, at least on weekdays, then can you design a recommendation system where in the morning, the app just tell you you should go to station A to pick up and then draw station B, and then your system can globally optimize the flow and all that. And then you can have incentives so that if I go to See, up, so this is where the, the pricing structure is, is broken because, I mean, the, I mean, there's this very slow feedback loop for an annual subscription. If, if, if they knew they were losing the user by not serving them that well, they would work better at serving the individual user better. 
Um, and, and this is a challenge. I mean, so it exactly sort of says that a lot of the, the analytic smarts to the system could be really pushed if they went to this two-tier system, because then they'd be incentivized to try to figure out how to deliver a higher quality of service. I mean, their range in which this individual level data could be used is all kinds of things. I mean, the censoring um, kind of thing, what we do is, is really primitive, but if, I mean, I mean, it's pretty frightening. If you look at you know, a user over you know, two months, you know a lot about that person's life um, and, and, and what you can infer in terms of whether they might be willing to, to, to shift one station over and, and all kinds of things w would be more effective if you went sort of in, and dealt with it at an individual user level. Yeah. So if you only had app data, that is new when a guy opened an app, you can put in incentives of where they pick up the bike or where they return the bike. Yep. Uh, is that being discussed? Uh, yes, um, but but the point is they, they they think it's hopeless that they'll get control back of I mean unless they completely shut I mean so the, the 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 agreement with the city requires that they be public about the JSON feed about you know what the the status is and that means that they're going to be third party providers and they've lost the users for 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 for, for well, the so they have to figure out ways that, that that users are incentivized to use the app so that then which the bike angels is doing so so the, the, that they're going to come back if you can get the yeah. reward if you use the yep. app yeah yeah it's, that's the app is good and they can use it but 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 for them the bigger threat is dockless and there the dockless is I mean, the, since the app is the unlocking business and they're already I mean I know there are negotiations going on. For, for having some sort of bimodal system within New York and, and, and I'm sure in many of their markets because I mean, M Mobike is, I mean, has, has certainly announced its intentions to open in DC. I don't know if it actually has started in DC. So, so now they have to get rights from the city and there are those kinds of fights that are coming. But, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, there, there certainly are discussions. All of your analysis, if I understand correctly, is based on stock levels of bikes and docks. You also have information on the routes that bikes take. You, you don't? No. So you don't know that, no. that bike A no, there are not, there are, Street and goes to might be, It might be an urban myth that, that the original fleet, um, at least in, in New York City, had GPS on them. Um, the original fleet was just. Well, I don't mean that you can track their actual movements. Oh, okay. But you know it went from this station to that station. Yes. 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 So all I wanted to ask is, is that information of any use? As far as I can tell, you never actually made use of it in any of the analysis you showed us. Doesn't it tell you something more that, that would be? So it comes into the sort of back-end simulation models, for one. So it also comes in. The other thing that it comes into play, and I've just completely put this under the rug, is that a lot of the models have gone to versions that are not just station-centric, but cluster of station-centric. So that we think about availability, we're thinking about it for a station and its, its neighbors rather than for the individual station. And therefore, knowing exactly right. you know, the, 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 the routing comes into play a bit. But I, I, there still isn't a lot of signal in terms of the, at least that, that we know how to use. There's one thing that we found, which I think is a, a very useful thing, perhaps, to mention. Um, you know, we had this sort of dollar a person per, uh, you know, per week number for Stanford, so that's four thousand dollars roughly at the bottom. Of it. Some people get five dollars, some people get three dollars, some people get twenty-five. It's like so. It's okay. Uh, surprisingly. Um, if you actually give ball tickets, which Stanford has a team that was doing well, okay, doing well. Yeah, the point is uh, that was so much more uh, people valued that a lot more, like disproportionately, because only so many of them, mm -hmm. uh, and they exceeded the monetary value, seventy-five dollars a ticket. Was, people acted like some tyrant of fifty dollars. Yeah. You know? So we got when we had uh, drives for enrollment. Uh, just the Rose Bowl tickets, five-day notice, we got 17% increase, which is like significant. Now all we have 10 tickets. Okay. Right. Yeah. So there's no way $750 could have got us, 75 times 10, could have got us 17% increase if it wasn't given out this way. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that someone from City, but I think I might have mentioned this to you, but, uh, I was suggesting, you know, approach the teams 
instead of giving dollars back to the incentives, if you approach the uh, like the local, you know. Base. Yeah, I mean, most of the. I mean, actually, at this point, a significant fraction, and I don't know how big it is at this point, of the prizes awarded um, for the incentives, which are again lottery based and all this, are actually one week free extensions to their membership. Right. <laughs> um, which of course, you know, this is exactly the best thing possible because um, you're keeping the people who are willing to do the, the against the main flow rides engaged in the system you want them, I mean, you, you, you are happy to pay them to, to keep riding. So, so, but I agree that's not the same thing as, as the well, occasional would, thing that would drive membership. Out. And that's, that's the point. If you were to give money up also, do consider these tickets like this. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. Extremely valuable from a person's perspective. Disproportionate. Okay. Uh, do you have a sense of how many trips shorter than one mile are made by bike versus walking versus Uber versus other modes? The simple answer is no. Um, no. I, I mean, it's a good question. I mean, especially the walk. I mean, I mean the the Uber. I guess no. We only have. I mean, the only thing they're public about is the pickup data. I guess taxi. We we. Could, but actually, that's probably bad data because how many times have, have any of us tried to use a taxi and told them we were only going there and they said, no, thank you? Um, I'm trying to so, wonder these bikes are taking away from walking trips. I, I mean, I think anecdotally, I mean, it, it, it's, it's extremely likely that those that are short are taking away from, from, from walking more than anything else. Um, but, you, you, I mean, the seasonal fluctuation is very large, if I'm not mistaken. It's not as large as you not think. Oh, okay. um, the, um, so, for example, I was just looking last month, um, which wasn't a particularly snowy December, um, but it was still pretty cold. There was one real cold snap. The, the typical average use was around 15,000 trips a day. Um, as opposed to 70, 75,000 at the peak of, of September. So it, it's a three to four as a factor, um, as long as there aren't extreme weather. That, that does suggest that if people still have to get from A to B, and if, they're, if they have some other mode to do it in the winter, it argues that this is not an actual necessity, that, that you, know, you, can, you can find an alternative mode if you, if you need to. So maybe we should thank David and enjoy the coffee. And I guess uh, we have been back in.